Right. Goal for this episode, try and not come across as a complete maniac. Although in fairness, it hasn't worked out too badly for me thus far. <laughs> Pickles and welcome to episode 30 of the Knitting Vicariously podcast. My name is Caroline. I'm found more commonly on Instagram and Ravelry as Dunderknit. I am a knitter living in London and if this is your first time joining us here on the podcast, a huge hello and welcome to you. I hope you're well as ever and as I'm well in the habit of now, a quick word of warning up front to let you know that this is a swearing friendly podcast and therefore the language, it gets a bit colourful from time to time. If you're a long-standing viewer, I appreciate you will be well informed to that effect and I'm so grateful to you for coming back. I really do hope you're well. And indeed, to those longest standing viewers, you may be aware that this week marks our one year anniversary, our pod anniversary, our vlog anniversary, our vicarious anniversary, call it what you will. Um, I hit publish on the very first episode of Knitting Vicariously back at the start of October last year in 2018, and therefore this episode marks the one year anniversary. So it's a year, and we have built this incredible community of people over here at Knitting Vicariously. I love coming to speak to you every other week and um, I, I really hope to continue doing so. I'm so delighted to have been able to connect with incredible makers the world over and the fact that we're bound together by this mutual love of knitting and creating and indeed appreciating those who also knit and create in ways in which our time doesn't always allow for us to be able to fully capitalise on. It's just been such a delight. To those of you who've been here since the start, a special thank you to all of you, but likewise to those of you who've joined subsequently, I hope you've enjoyed joining us, even if it were midway through. I do have to say a very special thank you to Stacey of the Stress Knit podcast for really figuratively twisting my arm into doing this in the first case, and then um, the, the day that I hit publish, making sure that she was um, supporting me very vocally, and so thank you so so much, particularly to you, Stacey, but indeed to everybody else who watched. And I know some of you have been watching since that very first day, and I'm so grateful to you for all of your support. I've had an opportunity to meet some of you already in person, either at Rhinebeck last year or at events across the UK since, and just long may that continue because you are excellent people. It's been a really interesting year within the knitting and crafting community and we've seen a number of really crucial discussions coming to light, particularly those around the themes of diversity and inclusion and racism within the crafting community as a whole. Um, those are subjects that I've tried to touch on here. I certainly haven't shied away from them, partly because I feel quite strongly about them and therefore this being a platform that's able to reflect that, I'd like to make sure that they're included. Um, but also because they are really fundamental topics and I can't imagine not including them in a space that corresponds so closely to, to where some of those subjects really hit home. So I'm delighted to see the stance that Ravelry have taken in being proactive in this space. I, I'd also like to try and ensure that as best we can, the community that we have around knitting vicariously is also representative of those views. And so I'm, you know, encouraged to say that in spite of a few, uh, very, very few kind of negative or problematic responses, um, the views shared by the people watching this podcast and who engage with this podcast have on the whole been representative of this too. So um, don't get me wrong, there is a huge amount of work still to be done in the anti-racism space and I'm speaking you know, <laughs> very much about myself uh, at no least at this point in time, but there is certainly more to be done but I'm encouraged by what we've seen so far and my hope is that by continuing to make these discussions visible and open um, we can only uh, continue to develop further in this space. I started this podcast at quite a self-reflective sort of time. I mentioned in the very first episode that I had been going through a divorce. I think at that point I was 
uh, just under a year away from having started that process and was coming to terms with it. And um, I've been contacted over the last year by a number of people who said that they've been going through something similar. And to see someone else talk about it, talk through it, has brought a, a huge amount of comfort to them. So if there is anything in the extreme silliness that I've shared over here in the last year or so that has helped you, I'm genuinely just so incredibly touched by that. Um, what I would say is that this has been an incredibly useful tool for me over the last year to kind of tap into uh, perhaps a bit of creativity or, or kind of self exploration than I kind of felt that I'd maybe lost for a while. Now I'm not a designer, I'm not a dyer, uh, I'm not someone with that kind of artistic leaning or talent to them and trust me there are some truly incredible talents out there um, that I'm more than happy to support um, but good heavens there's not the faintest chance that I would ever begin to try and emulate. But um, what I would say is that this podcast has given me a really interesting platform to explore that creativity in a slightly different sense. I love language, I love theatre, I love coming up with ideas and thinking about how to execute them and this podcast has been phenomenal for that. Um, Vlogmas in particular was a bit of a high point there. Um, it was a really interesting format that allowed me to play quite a lot uh, with a few different things. And those of you who suffered through my Vlogmas last year will know that there were certainly some quirky bits in there. <laughs> and I really, really enjoyed it. So to everyone who is still watching and who has watched for the last year, I can only say a massive thank you from my side for, for giving me the permission to kind of play around with this format and to play in this space. I'm delighted that so many of you have enjoyed it and long may it continue. But here we are a year on and we are fast approaching Rhinebeck 2019. And in celebration of Rhinebeck 2019, we are hosting our glorious gold along. This is a knit along, crochet along, general make along of all things gold. And indeed, we are being pretty fucking broad in our definition of gold, as I am, of course, want to be. And so this is a make along that encourages us to make and indeed wear with pride all of our gloriously golden wares on Rhinebeck weekend which is the 19th and 20th of October so it is coming up fairly soon. To those of you unable to make Rhinebeck in person for whatever reason, be it it's just not your bag, it's too far away, it's not a date that's going to work for you or many other reasons besides, you are entirely welcome, if not indeed gently encouraged, to wear a little bit of gold in solidarity with us that weekend. We will be using the Glorious Gold Along hashtag on Instagram. I will also be opening up the Glorious Gold Along thread on Ravelry to allow us to showcase all of the fact fabulous things that we're wearing and hopefully enjoy a little bit of Rhinebeck spirit albeit vicariously. For those of you who are attending Rhinebeck in person and would like to show off your fabulous golden wares on the day, I am thinking, uh, and a couple of people have asked me about this, it would be wonderful for anyone and indeed everyone who would like to meet in person and to, to have a bit of a communal gold fest at a certain point in time. Um, I know the Saturday on the hill, for anyone who's been before or is attending there for the first time, uh, there's a kind of main entrance way and then there are sort of two forked paths as you make your way up some of the barns. There's barns A, B, C uh, up on the right hand side and then there's more of the kind of food uh, trucks and heading up to some of the other barns on the left hand side. The area just to the left hand side there is I believe referred to as the hill um, and so that tends to be where things like the Ravelry meetup takes place, it tends to be where the podcaster meetup takes place and if previous years are anything to go by, the Ravelry meetup is usually at 12 o'clock noon, I believe, on the Saturday, whereas the, pod the podcaster meetup tends to start around 1pm on the Saturday as well. Now those times kind of blur into one another. In general, it's just a massive huddle of people in a certain space with lots of shrieking and hand waving and general effusion at being able to see people in real life that you've previously only seen through screens or chats or um, kind of, you know, Ravelry channels and so on. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to make that all come to life. And so I'm thinking it would probably be a good opportunity for us to meet there. Tentatively, I'm going to suggest 1.30 for anyone who wants to come along and have a bit of a communal gold loving at that 
that point in time. Um, I will double check times and just make sure that that's one that sort of works. I don't want to clash with too many other things that are going on. Heaven knows there are more than enough things going on at Rhinebeck for them to just steal your attention but um, I'm trying to carve out a little bit of time for anyone who does want to come along to meet us there. Now, I fully appreciate that's not gonna be everyone's bag. Part of the reason for doing the gold along is so that you can flash a little bit of it, however secretively and slyly you wish to do so. Um, if attention or kind of big group gatherings isn't your bag, hopefully that'll allow you to feel part of the group without necessarily needing to be quite so pronounced about it. But for anyone who does want to come along, Tentatively, let's say 1.30 and I will confirm a little bit nearer the time. Also for Rhinebeck, we will be doing what we did last year for Rhinebeck, what we did this year for EYF, which is for everyone who is not able to attend in person, I will be hosting a vicarious Rhinebeck giveaway. This is a giveaway where I pick up a few bits and pieces that I find that really catch my eye at the festival to create a little prize package for people who aren't able to attend. And I'll open up a thread likely to coincide with the next episode, which will be in two weeks. So the second weekend in October, October, the weekend before Rhinebeck, I'll open up a thread over in the Ravelry group where you'll be able to go in and tell me the way in which you're looking to celebrate that weekend, whether it's, you know, kind of trolling through Instagram photos, suffering from a little bit of FOMO, or whether it is perhaps embracing the yarn festival fumes in a way that best suits you. Crumbs, there's a lot of stuff to get through this week. Um, in terms of me and what's been going on here, I mean, autumn is well and truly here, which I'm delighted about. It has been absolutely pissing it down for the best part of this week. Um, but in all honesty, if it's a choice between that and it being humid and horribly warm, which I know some of the folks over in the US have had to contend with, my sympathies, um, I, I would rather the like 14 degree rainy days that we've had here, that's fine by me. Even if it means that my feet are in a constant state of kind of soddenness, I'm, I'm kind of all right with it. It also means that I've been able to get a bit more knitting done and we will talk about this situation a little bit later. Um, but part of the reason I was able to get a fair bit of knitting done this week is because last weekend, I went up to Bloody Scotland. I mentioned this in the previous episode. Bloody Scotland is a crime writing festival that takes place every September in Stirling, which is a beautiful city, not far outside of Edinburgh, about 40 minutes away. It is a, in, just, it's the most wonderful destination for a festival like this. It is beautiful, it's quite compact, you can wander around, you can see some of the city, and it is very much at the sort of entry point to the Scottish Highlands, so it's a great place and a base to go and explore from. But I was there for three days, so I travelled up on the Friday, um, I worked most of the Friday afternoon, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, it was, it was fairly intense. I had a lot of people at work saying to me, oh, you know, you enjoying your holiday this weekend? And they're going, it's not the word I'd use to describe it. <laughs> um, I ended up uh, volunteering up there. So uh, I mentioned last time that my mum was one of the original um, sort of co-founders of the festival. She was on the board and helped to set it up in its initial few years. As such, I went up and helped out at the festival a couple of times. And because I've done a little bit of stage management and helping out backstage when I was at university, I ended up supporting the um, technical staff in the theatre and in particular helping to sort of get authors microphoned up before they head out on stage, moving around some furniture on there, um, and generally getting an opportunity to listen to some incredible speakers, albeit from a non-vantage vantage point backstage. I could hear everything that was going on, thanks to some excellent microphoning work. Um, but, um, but obviously I wasn't necessarily able to see it, being as I was backstage for the most part. But some really incredible authors. So it was opened by David Baldacci on the Friday night. Um, we had my favourites who, Chris Brookmeyer, Mark Billingham, Stuart McBride throughout the weekend, some really truly hilarious uh, talks and uh, time slots. Richard Osman was there, who UK folks may well know for um, being a an incredible TV producer. I know he has TV production credits to his name across a multiple uh, a multitude of panel shows and obviously Pointless, which is a big sort of game show here in the UK. Uh, he was great fun. He has a crime novel coming out next year, which sounds excellent and I'm very excited about that. Um, and then the keynote on the Saturday night was an incredible event. So that was Ian Rankin being interviewed by the Scottish First Minister, who is Nicola Sturgeon. And um, 
yes, I did end up microphoning both of them. That was quite an experience. Um, so all in all, it was a really incredible event and I really enjoyed it. If uh, crime novels are your thing and you fancy a couple of days in Scotland, I would highly recommend you check out Bloody Scotland for next year. It's always a great event. Um, there's a huge amount going on over the course of the weekend and um, yeah, it's definitely one for anyone to get a little bit of crime book nerdery on. But look, that is more than enough preamble because goodness knows I actually have some stuff that I need to talk to you about this week. So uh, with very little further ado, I will just let you know right up front that show notes for this week's episode as ever can be found in the description box below as well as over in our Ravelry group, which is the Knitting Vicariously podcast group. You can, of course, find us by searching Knitting Vicariously over on Ravelry. Similarly, you can also follow the Knitting Vicariously Instagram account. It's separate to my own personal account and it's an account that I use to post every time there is a new episode of the podcast and I include hashtags and at um, mentions? What, what do we call those? Handles? Instagram handles? Instagram names of everyone that's featured as part of the episode just to make stalking them that little bit easier for all of you. But with no further ado, I am going to talk to you about what I'm wearing because this segment is making a long awaited comeback. I have a finished object of what I'm wearing in all of its glorious golden glory. Sure, let's let's go with that. This is my shifted pullover. I will put a picture of it over here so you can see what the finished version should look like and hopefully what it fairly closely resembles. This is a pattern by Justina Lerkowska. She is Letty's Knits over on Instagram and indeed Ravelry. It's a pattern that I have bored you witless about on multiple occasions now. Ever since she first included that pattern picture over on her uh, Instagram feed, I think in about May 2018, I have been obsessed with this sweater. It's a drop shoulder version of a pattern that I knit previously. There is a raglan version, which is the shifting sweater. Um, I knit that back in 2013. I started knitting it 2015. I finished knitting it because sometimes I need a time to process. Um, and I mentioned in the previous episode that that coincided with a number of my friends who at that point I had not met in real life wearing a shifting rainbow to Rhinebeck all those years ago. And so the fact that I'm going back this year with a shifted sweater, uh, it just feels very kind of complete and callbacky and I'm very happy about it. So. I am going to stand up, I'm going to show off the sweater in its glory and um, yeah, speak to you in a second. Well, here you have it. These shifted boobs, they make a long-awaited return. I mean, long-awaited might be. Anyway, let's, let's skim past that. This is my shifted sweater. It is a fabulous, as you can see, drop shoulder shape. So if I stand here, you can see it is drop shoulder all the way down. Oh, hello. We're not focusing on me. There we go. Um, it is bang on mid hip length as my sweaters are wont to be. And I have blocked it fairly aggressively. I will talk to that in a second or two. Um, but this, because of all the cables that you have the whole way across the body of the sweater, it does want to like pinch in a little bit and therefore it did require some fairly aggressive blocking to ensure that it drapes as it should. I knit the size 44 of this sweater, sorry, 44 or 45, um, pretty sure it's the 45 inch bust, which is, it gives me about one inch positive ease on my bust, but again, because the cables pull it in, it sits sort of fairly, fairly flush, shall, shall we say. Oh. Sorry, we're having some focusing issues today because it is very grey and rainy outside. Um, but yes, so this is my shifted sweater. You can see it has these cables all over, so both the front and indeed the back, which hopefully you can see. I have no idea. Um, it has a just a simple two by two hem down here at the bottom, as you're able to see. It is a bottom up sweater in its construction. So um, 
you will have seen in previous weeks that I had to battle uh, with my usual kind of lack of attention span, let's call it that, uh, to knit the bottom up section before then splitting for the armholes. Then you knit the front and back flat, back and forth. You seam uh, the shoulder seams here, which you can see. I did a three needle bind off on there. Uh, it calls for something slightly different. I'm gonna be honest and say at that point in time, I was quite tired, so chose to ignore the other instructions and just went with the three needle bind off because that's what I know and love. Uh, and from there, you pick up around the top of the armholes here and knit down. There are some decreases on the arm, which you should hopefully be able to see running down here. Um, but then yeah, it's just very simple. I am genuinely delighted with how this has turned out. This is probably one of my best fitting sweaters to date. Um, the drop shoulder style is one that I've always known works really nicely on me and my figure, particularly for those of us that have a more sizable bust. Um, although in all honesty, I think it is a size and shape that can flatter pretty much anyone. So um, yes, I will sit down and talk to you about it a little bit more, but hurrah, hurrah for shifted and my glorious gold long sweater for rain back this year. And I'm back. So yes, I love this sweater. I really genuinely love this sweater. There's so much about it to love. Now, um, the only thing that I haven't shown you yet is the collar up here. So let me scooch in and get all up and personal up in your business for the collar. Um, again, I changed the instructions and didn't quite follow the instructions on the collar. The way that they have you do it for the collar in the pattern is there's quite a pronounced um, stitch. I think you purl the first row if you follow the instructions um, so that you've got a nice purl ridge around the edge. I couldn't really be bothered at that point. Um, I did really just want to get this done. I The picking up stitches and purling them, for me, it just looks a bit weird. Um, it's probably something to do with my technique, the way that I do it, but I was kind of at the point where I didn't really want to struggle through doing something that I wasn't really sure that I liked as a feature, so I figured, hey, bollocks to it, why not let's just pick up and knit two by two ribbing in a fairly standard fashion. So that is what I did. Um, other than that though, so between the sleeves and the collar here, those were all bound off using Laurie's twisty bind off, which I have talked about previously. It is absolutely my preferred bind off of choice for any ribbing. It tends to, it gives more than enough stretch. I find it doesn't flare in the way that Jenny's Super Stretchy Bind Off does. And um, it just gi it gives a really, really nice stretchy edge to all of my fabrics. So I really do enjoy knitting that one. Um, the hem of the sweater was started using, I believe that was just, an, um, it wasn't an alternate cable cast on, it was a German twisted cast on for the uh, bottom of the sweater, which matches quite nicely with Laurie's twisty bind off. So I will make sure that I include a link to that bind off in the show notes below. Um, I'm trying to think what else to say about this now. As I mentioned, it is the size 45, so it gives me a little bit of positive ease, but certainly not much. The pattern actually recommends quite a bit more positive ease than this. It usually recommends about four inches of positive ease. I wanted something that was a little bit closer fitting. Um, I also just didn't want to do as much knitting. <laughs> That's such a terrible admission, but it's kind of true. Um, I, I wanted something that was a bit closer fitting anyway, and also a bottom-up sweater with that much positive ease. I mean, it's a lot of extra knitting and I just couldn't really be fucked with this. So um, yeah, mo moving on. <laughs> so professional. Um, it is knit out of Madeline Tosh uh, BFL DK in the glazed pecan colorway. This is yarn that I picked up from their website in a sale, I wanna say probably a couple of years ago now. BFL DK, I'm not sure if they still stock this base, but it is 100% Superwash Blue Flace Leicester. Um, it's DK weight, it is 242 yards or 221 meters. Um, and I have found it's slightly thinner than their DK twist base. Um, the pattern recommends a sport weight, but in all honesty, I think you could probably get away with DK, um, especially DK that is slightly finer and knits up at a similar gauge. Um, 
in terms of needles, I used the recommended needle sizes throughout, which was a 3.5 millimeter for all of the ribbing and a four millimeter for the body of the sweater itself. I did check my gauge as I went and it was pretty spot on, which I was happy with. And I was also able to use some fairly strenuous blocking to ensure that I got the drape that I wanted out of the sweater itself. So um, when I say blocking, there were a couple of people who said, can you show us how you block your sweaters? Um, I wasn't that organised, not going to lie. Um, but what I will do is I will include a picture over here of the sweater while it was blocking. I have a kit of blocking wires. These are just long, reasonably thin, but very sturdy straight wires um, that I put into the sweater. So I put one up the side seam on this side, coming out the top here, and the other on the side seam at this side, coming out the top here, and stretched it as far as wide as I wanted it to be when on blocking mats, pinned those down and put a third um, blocking wire sort of wove that through the hem of the sweater so it was flat or rather so the hem of the sweater lay um, sort of reasonably flat on both sides at the same height and just pinned that out so you can probably see that from the picture I've put up on there. Um, I did use some wool wash that is entirely up to you as to whether you choose to do that. Um, there was a time last year when I had a little bit of a tuft woolens addiction um, I mean since then a, a very weak pound has put paid to that a little bit but um, Tough Woolens makes some incredible wool soaps. Similarly, um, there's a bunch of them that you can get here in the UK. I know that Nora George has dipped her toe in that direction and uh, wowzers, I'm very excited about that. Um, but in all honesty, uh, a sort of simple wool wash or even, I know some people have had great success with the likes of kind of, um, very mild hair conditioners and so on in the past. Just make sure that you don't have anything that's going to be too problematic with natural fibres in there. Um, so yes, that is how I went about blocking the sweater. And as soon as it was blocked and, and almost dry, <laughs> as I discovered once I put it on, um, I popped it on and just realised how incredibly happy I am with this sweater and how wearable it's going to be, not just at Rhinebeck, but hopefully beyond as well. And so, um, yeah, really, really pleased with this sweater. Other than some of the details that I've mentioned in terms of ignoring uh, some of the instructions about creating a nice line on the shoulder seam and a nice line around the collar, um, I didn't really make any modifications. The only ones I did clearly were as a result of laziness rather than any other kind of creative intent. So um, yeah, we're all good. We're all good. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd recommend this pattern wholeheartedly. Don't get me wrong. I think bottom up is still a construction that I find challenging, more challenging than some of the others out there. Um, but I will say, and I think I mentioned this last time, um, the, the sort of cable pattern, I didn't find it too bad. I got into quite a nice rhythm with it. I didn't find it too sloggy. I didn't have to keep referring back to the chart because ultimately it's the same thing the whole way across the body of the sweater. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend this as a pattern. Justine Lurkowska's patterns are both pretty well written and indeed pretty inclusive when it comes to their sizing. So um, I'd recommend you stop over and take a look at her patterns and hopefully you find something that you love. So yes, my glorious gold long project, it is finished. This is what I will be wearing on the Saturday at Rhinebeck. So hopefully between this and the hair and the inevitable um, urban jungle hat that I've shown in previous weeks, which is the fabulous, fabulous leopard print hat um, by Unwind Knitwear. Between all of those things, hopefully, I don't think I'll be too hard to spot. So if you do want to try and track me down, have a look out for those and I'm sure I won't be far behind. In terms of works in progress, this is not the only thing that I have been working on. No, indeed, because as part of my travels up to Scotland, I was able to get a fair bit of work done on another Rhinebeck sweater that I have in the works at the moment. It is living in another fabulous Tani Casey bag. Those of you who've been around will know my love for Tani Casey's project bags. This is one of her large drawstring bags with this incredible incredible leaf print fabric with all the little accents. Obviously there is some gold in there, which makes me very happy. Um, and it's got the wax canvas bottom. I love her bags. You know, I love her bags. Um, and living in here is my farmhouse cardigan. I spoke about this at length last episode. I'll put a picture up here for you to see what the finished version should look like. 
This is another sweater that I am knitting for Ryan Beck and as I mentioned last time it is in support of a very very dear friend of mine who is Connie, she's Lemon Tangos over on Instagram and um, Connie knit a farmhouse cardigan earlier in the year to attend Vogue Knitting Live um, but at the point in time didn't really feel comfortable doing so. She wrote an incredible post over on Instagram about her feelings on the subject and so um, a few of us decided that what we really wanted to do was to show our support of Connie and emphasize how wonderful we all know her to be by knitting a similar version. So this is my farmhouse cardigan uh, in terms of how far I've got with it. It's a little bit unwieldy to show you here on the needles but let me hold it up here so you can see. This is how far I am with it. It's another bottom-up sweater because apparently I'm that much of a glutton for punishment. Um, but as you can see there is the ribbing here on the bottom. It then goes into this incredible texture that I will hold up for you to appreciate. Apologies, you've got a little bit of camera shadow on there, but hopefully you should be able to... Oh, hello. That's blown it out tremendously. Um, it's not quite that kind of crazy a teal green. If anything, it is more of a dark emerald, but at least you should be able to see and appreciate the fabulously squishy texture that this cardigan is going to... Um, bring in spades. So it has a button band included within the pattern itself. As you can see, it's just this garter ridge button band that runs up the front on both sides. I mentioned last time that I'm not including buttonholes or putting buttons onto the sweater. Partly, again, laziness. Kind of alright with that. Um, but also partly because I just don't really wear my cardigans buttoned up at all. I think I sort of pull them around me, but other than that, buttoned up is not really a thing that I do embrace all of those words. Um, but certainly I have added in the little pocket linings, albeit they are not yet stitched down. So if I show you the guts of the sweater, you can see this is just flapping in the wind. Uh, I do need to whip stitch that down on the inside. I do though, because you're looking at this and you're like, Caroline, you've not made a huge amount of progress given you were sitting backstage for like two and a half days. Oh, ye of little faith. Because, well, in addition to the two and a half days backstage, I also had two fairly lengthy train journeys to contend with. And so, look at how grown up I am. I've knit the fucking sleeves already as well. I know, we're all shocked. So here, we have two sleeves. I know! Um, one of these was knit entirely on the train journey back down, the other I was able to bust out yesterday whilst watching a fair bit of World Athletics Championships coverage and a little bit of F1 in the evening. I love athletics. I'm just going to stop in here and say I'm so excited about the World Championships right now. I'm also very excited about Tokyo 2020. I just, yeah, I love it. Um, but yeah, so I was able to bust out a fair bit of knitting on that as well. In terms of the yarn, I spoke about this last week too. I am knitting it out of Cascade Eco Plus in the, I believe it's the spruce colorway, which is this kind of emeraldy green. I mentioned last week as well that um, Cascade is a yarn company not without their problems. They've made some very, very controversial and problematic statements about uh, a number of different subjects. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail, um, but certainly uh, it's, it's worth looking into those if you want to be a little bit more conscious about the types of yarn that you buy. Um, in this instance, for me, um, this is stash yarn, so I had a look back. Um, I did buy this yarn in 2011, which I think I mentioned in the last episode. I either bought this yarn because a couple of people made suggestions. It was either Romney Wools in Toronto or Knitomatic in Toronto, both incredible yarn stores that I remember going to visit with a huge amount of joy. Um, so it was one of the two, I'm not totally sure which, but um, certainly this is yarn that I feel by putting it into a project that is in support of a fabulous, fabulous woman of colour and friend, um, I'm trying to essentially repurpose this yarn into something that is a little bit more positive and a move away from the brand and uh, the people behind the company who've made some fairly heinous statements in the past. So there we go, repurposing yarn with a better purpose all round um, is something I am a big fan of whenever we can. So I'd like to say this is knitting up fairly quickly, but in all honesty, the body is definitely proving to be a bit of a slog. I do think that's probably why I went and moved on to the sleeves, partly because this was getting a bit unwieldy to take out and just kind of knit away on the train, um, but also because 
I'm gonna need to move my progress keeper. I've still got my progress keeper in here, which is my little Starbucks cup from the corner of craft. I'm showing you all my sweater guts at the same time, but this is a fabulous progress keeper that I want you to be able to see. Um, love that. But um, I've kept that in from last time to show me how much progress I've made since the last episode. I do now need to move it so that I can feel as though I am making progress because the body of this sweater is feeling very sloggy. Um, I was hopeful it was gonna get quicker once I got to sort of past the, the pockets and moving up. I've since heard from other friends who've been knitting the sweater that indeed once you attach the sleeves, if anything, it, it gets worse. So. <laughs> Looking forward to that. I have just under three weeks now until I head off for Rhinebeck. I am leaving uh, around about the 16th of October. So, um, I mean, really not much longer to go, about two and a half weeks. So I need to get a definite wiggle on with this sweater. So um, yeah, gonna try and stay monogamous on this for a little bit longer. In terms of needles, as with everything, I'm knitting them on my Chagu interchangeables. I'm knitting it on 5.5 millimeter needles, which is a US size nine, and it is part of the large Chagu interchangeable set, as I mentioned last time. These are my needles of choice. It's going fairly swiftly on these. One thing I will say that is vastly helpful with this pattern is the texture is knit on the wrong side as opposed to the right side and what that means is that you are knitting the texture uh, or rather working the texture on the pearl what would be the pearl side so not all of the stitches are pearl stitches I don't want to give the pattern away it is paid for but just so you're aware whereas the right side it's all knit stitches so that bit goes fairly swiftly it's just the other ones where it's definitely a little bit sloggy but um we're getting there we're getting there so um yes this is where i'm at on farmhouse i'm hoping to be a lot further on next episode Moving along into vicarious knitting this week, and I have a couple of bits to share with you. As ever, there's some patterns that have caught my eye. I mean, I will say, in all honesty, the fact that we've had a shift in the weather recently has sent my knitting mojo sky high. So many of the patterns that I've mentioned to you over the summer in particular, but even dating all the way back to spring, and some of the things I was talking about in the run up to Edinburgh Yarn Festival, they're coming back onto my radar, and I just want to knit all the things with a vengeance. And the fact that I'm knitting the second of two bottom-up sweaters <laughs> is trying that fucking patience a little bit just now. So, you know, I need to persevere with it. I desperately want this cardigan in place for Rhinebeck, but good Lord, I'm getting itchy knitting fingers. Um, and so I will share with you a couple of the patterns that I have been knitting vicariously in my mind over the last couple of weeks. The first pattern that I'm going to share with you is a designer that is entirely new to me. This is someone who cropped up in my Instagram feed uh, in the last couple of weeks, partly because if you have Instagram, you know the little explore function that you've got on there. I like to dip in there every now and again. It usually surfaces an absolute glorious surfeit of glorious gold along projects, which I love. But actually, when I went in there, the um, Instagram user that I came across was a designer and it's called Valentina's Knits. Now, Valentina is the most incredible knitwear designer. There's one picture that she showed of a recent project she's knit that is as currently unnamed, but it's a beautiful sweater. I'm gonna put a picture of it up here so you can appreciate it. I will be stalking her site gently to see as and when that has a release associated with it because I think it's stunning, but what that prompted was an opportunity for me to go back through some of her previous sweater designs, and indeed, there were more than a few that caught my eye. The one, however, that I really wanted to call out is the Momentum sweater. I'll put a picture of it up here. It is by Valentina Bogdanova, and it is absolutely gorgeous. So you know, having talked about my Siri pullover in the past, I've got a great love for kind of textured or lace uh, yokes in particular, and this is definitely a great example of that. You can see that it looks really, really stunning. There is a bit of lace, there's a bit of texture in this yoke. It's knit out of worsted weight, so it's not too delicate either. It's got some real kind of proper oomph to it is the word that I'm going to use. I just love the fact that her design as well is knit out of this beautiful, very dainty pink colour, but I've seen an awful lot of really great examples of it in other colours. There is one execution in particular that caught my eye. It's knit in a very beautiful sort of dark green foresty yarn. Now, 
I know I'm knitting with dark green and I'd still clearly have a love of gold. Don't worry that I'm going too much to the sort of emerald green dark side, but it did really catch my eye and it had a slight bit of mohair and fuzz to it. It was just stunning. So I do urge you to go and have a look at some of the other uh, completed projects and examples of the Momentum sweater. Similarly, the fact that it's got these beautiful lace panels down the sleeve, I think just adds a lot of, um, a kind of uniqueness to this sweater. It's not a combination I've seen before. I think it's absolutely beautiful. In terms of sizing, it's great as well. So uh, it has around about four inches of ease built into it and it is sized for chest uh, sizes from 30 inches up to 66. So again, fantastic as far as size inclusivity goes. And I just think a really, really excellent uh, pattern for anyone looking for something that is quite, kind of knitting statement, I want to say, but also good and cosy. The fact that it is this really lovely lace and texture wrapped up in worsted yarn, I think is something that I haven't really seen too much of this year, and I'm a big, big fan. So that's my first pattern pick for this week. My second is a mystery knit along. Now, you're looking at me and going, hang on, Caroline, one, how on earth can you recommend a mystery knit along before you've actually seen any of the mystery knit along? That feels somewhat counterintuitive. And two, Caroline, we've never known you to work on a mystery knit along. And you're not wrong, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> mystery knit alongs I I'd sort of have mixed feelings about. I love the idea of them. I'm just, I'm not really a control freak, but at the same time, I know myself well enough to know that I really need to know that I want the finished object of something before I push myself into it. It takes a lot to get me over that hurdle, but this is one that just might do exactly that. Now, I do have a slight ulterior motive for talking to you about this this week, not least because I find the whole thing frankly fucking hilarious. Um, Mary Annarella, who is Lyrical Knits, has put together a mystery knit along based around the Great British Bake Off, or to those of you in the States, the Great British Baking Show. And um, if you are familiar with Mary's YouTube channel, or indeed if you've been following her over on Instagram, you may have seen a little sneak peek preview video that she put together to that effect. Now, Mary is someone who I've known through Ravelry for quite some years now. I got to meet her over at Edinburgh Yarn Festival last year, back in 2018, and then again at Rhinebeck. She is a wonderful human being and an excellent designer. And to all of those strings, she has added both an amazing mystery knit along and indeed some truly excellent British accents. <laughs> so, Mary got in touch with me a few weeks ago now to mention that this was on her radar, something she was planning to do, and would I be able to help out with a few little accent and tidbits thrown in for her video. I gleefully said yes, because there is nothing I enjoy more than just taking the piss out of anything. <laughs> particularly where accents are involved. Um, so yes, if you have had a chance to watch her preview video, which I will link in the show notes below if you've missed that so far, um, listen out for a few vocal, I'm, I'm not gonna call them talents, let's just go for executions. <laughs> and I mean that in all senses <laughs> of the English language. <laughs> But this is a mystery shawl knit along where, just frankly, if shawls are already your bag, if colour and amazing kind of high-end execution, because Mary's patterns are all superb, um, if those are your bag, and also if you just enjoy a little bit of baking silliness, I would genuinely recommend that you pop over and check out this knit along. Um, I know that there is a discount on the pattern until all October 6th, um, and so if you do head on over to her Ravelry page, I would uh, just check it out, embrace it. I'm sure you will have an absolute whale of a time. I suspect at that point, I'm still gonna be frantically trying to dash through my farmhouse cardigan, but if I do have the opportunity to join, I am very, very sorely tempted to do so because this looks as though it's going to be epic. 
And last but not least, the third pattern that's caught my eye is another sweater pattern. Again, this was over on Instagram. I followed the designer, I saw the um, pictures that she'd put up over there, and I dropped everything and made sure that I was heading into Ravelry to see it in a bit more detail. This is the Achi Kochi sweater by Eri TML, who is Eri TML over on Instagram. It is an absolutely gorgeous design very graphic, very, very bold. It's a little bit reminiscent of, there was a sweater in one of the previous liner magazines, which was called After Party. It's slightly reminiscent of that, but I would say this is even more kind of graphic in its intent, partly down to the contrasting colors on the hem, for instance, and some of the cuffs. It's a really stunning design. It is knit out of biche et bouche, Oh, French pronunciation coming to the fore. Um, it's uh, some of their gorgeous petit lambs wool. Um, so it's going to be beautifully soft and cozy and incredibly lightweight for something that's going to be so warm in the coming colder months. And so it's definitely something I recommend you checking out. In terms of sizing, it does pretty well on that front. I know that at the upper end, you are looking at about a 56 and a half inch bust. There are a couple of inches built in for ease, so worth bearing that in mind. And at the lower end, let me just double check. Um, so the smallest size is around about a 38 inch bust, but again, she does mention there's a fair bit of positive ease built in. Um, so perhaps could do a little bit better on the smaller end of the spectrum and indeed the larger end of the spectrum, but um, a fairly wide range there in the middle at least. But yeah, I really love this pattern. The lighter grey version in particular, she has both a lighter grey and a darker grey using the same colours, just inverted on her pattern page. And I really, really do like that. So um, if I can ever bring myself to knit a really kind of quite a full on garment in yarn that is quite that fine, <laughs> this is definitely at the top of my list. I love the idea of having a lightweight, very cozy sweater. I just know myself and my limits. If you are a, a more committed, better person than I am, <laughs> um, which let's face it, there are plenty of you out there, um, this, this may be one for you. For me, it might end up being a little bit more vicarious in the short term until I can really bring myself to commit because my lord, it is stunning. As ever, we've got some glorious gold along projects to share with you, but just before we do that, I have some acquisitions to talk to you about. Now, it's been a fair old while since I showed those here on the podcast, and in all honesty, I'm not really sure why that is. I, I have been buying a little bit less yarn this year than in previous years. Um, I don't entirely think it's the podcast that's holding me to account for that. Um, I think it's probably more this that's holding me to account for that. I'm certainly trying wherever I can to make use of my stash with new projects um, rather than buying yarn. But, um, you know, I've got a fair few things to be working with in fairness. But these are not yarny purchases. These are in fact project bag purchases. So let me grab them. I'll, I will show them to you momentarily. So once again, I have Instagram to blame for both of these purchases. The first of these um, is by a fantastic maker, Kalisha, who is Nadira Tani over on Instagram and indeed on YouTube, is the incredible talent behind the Quirky Monday Craftcast. She is someone who is so joyful and such an absolute pleasure to watch. I've talked about her here in the podcast in the past. The fact that she has this incredibly enigmatic smile. She is one of those people who you will sit and you will watch her and you will find yourself grinning from ear to ear every time she does so. And I just, if you don't watch her podcast already, you should, please go and please do it because she is an absolute delight. She is also an incredibly talented bag maker and had been mentioning over on Instagram that she was making a series of bags to support a fabulous charity. So Kalisha talks at length and very, very eloquently about a number of causes, in particular suicide awareness. And um, I believe that the bags that she was putting together were in support of a charity. That charity in particular is To Write Love on Her Arms, which is T-W-L-O-H-A. 
A over on Instagram. Again, I will link that in the show notes below, which is a non-profit that's dedicated to helping and supporting people with depression and uh, potentially suicidal thoughts on there as well. She had been creating these bags with a portion of her profit from those sales going to support this charity. And indeed, the bags were emblazoned with messages that really resonated with her uh, along those lines. I was delighted and lucky enough to snag one of those bags in her sale over on Etsy and here it is. So refuse to sink was the caption that really caught my eye. I love this idea of just being incredibly kind of proactive and um, frankly stubborn in the face of adversity. That's something that absolutely resonates with me as, uh, as a statement. I'm going to hold it up so you can see not only the incredible stitching that's on there but also some of the little details. So we have uh, a little gold zip pool here which can be used as a progress keeper and similarly there is a tiny little, let me just turn it so you can see it, just little made with love tag on there as well. It is incredibly well made. There's a strap here on the side so I can hold it on my wrist while I work with it and similarly it is, as I say, just such an incredible quality bag. I will hold it open. It is obviously gloriously yellow here in the middle and I will hold it up so you can see her little Quirky Monday logo on there too. It's a beautifully made bag. It's a fabulous cause. It is um, in support of an amazing, amazing enterprise and also a maker that I think just brings such joy to the community and I'm delighted to know. So um, thank you so, so much, Kalisha, for all that you do. These bags are incredible. I know she's been talking about potentially uh, doing something else in this space. So again, please do hop on over to her YouTube channel, Quirky Monday Craftcast, and ensure that you're keeping up to speed with all that she does. Thank you so much for that, Kalisha. You're an absolute joy of a human being. Um, the other purchase that I have is also a project bag and I do also have Instagram to blame for this. For those of you who are UK based or watch other UK podcasters, in particular Amy of the Stranded Dye Works, uh, sorry, of the Stranded Podcast and Stranded Dye Works, which is her yarn dyeing brand, um, she has mentioned and talked about at length a fabulous maker of bags that goes under the brand of Hyde and Hammer. New is based here in the UK. She makes some absolutely stunning project bags. I know a few of my friends have benefited from them over the years um, and I know that those have gone as far afield as the US in particular. Um, and I was having a little nosy over on Instagram. I realised to my horror that I didn't follow her and so I rectified that immediately and in so doing I spotted, oh you can tell where this is going, um, she, she had announced that she was going to be making a run of bags in a very particular colour hmm. and uh, that was a colour that needed to be in my life because it's gingerbread and it's amazing! <laughs> Look at how pretty this is. This is the Hyde and Hammer, it's the roll top bag. It is fabulously big and sturdy. It's made out of canvas. I will hold it up to the camera so you can appreciate it in all of its glory and it is just such an incredibly well-made endeavor. I'm, I'm in love with it. So it does have this tab here on the top. It's got all these metal fixtures. If I pop it off here and it is still sort of fairly sturdy because the leather is obviously fairly new. It's a roll top bag. So if I unroll that, you will be able to see that I've got the clasp here in the front, the side panel here, and then inside, is just, I mean, look at how huge this is, it's insane, um, is the amazing guts of this bag. So there are, I don't know how well you'll be able to see it because it feels a bit cavernous, but there is a pouch here at the front, there's another at the back with a series of little uh, individual needle holders, for instance, and it's just, it's immense. I love this thing. Um, it's so ridiculously well made. The canvas is beyond sturdy. I mean, this could take a hell of a beating. Uh, I have no, no concerns whatsoever about taking this in bags, chucking it in places and it, you know, faring entirely imperviously. Um, 
I just, this is gonna be such an amazing bag going forward. The gingerbread color obviously stole my heart the second I saw it. Um, and so I was delighted to be able to grab that. However, I know she also has a number of other different finishes, including waxed canvas, which is one that I've seen with Amy for a while. She's got a gorgeous mustard yellow version. I've seen all sorts of different versions, but this one, I mean, I mean, it was inevitable, wasn't it? Wasn't it? So yes, thank you so, so much, New, for all that you do. This bag is incredible. And um, if you're in the market for a bit of a treat along these lines, I would recommend that you stalk her over on Instagram because her bags do sell out pretty darn quickly. I do know that Nu is going to be appearing at an event later on this autumn. The Make Joy event is taking place on Sunday the 3rd of November here in London. I'll include a link in the show notes below where you can find out a little bit more about it, but it looks as though it's going to be a great little marketplace and an opportunity for folks to get together towards the end of the year. So there was Yarn Porium that took place last year. I think I mentioned that around about that time last year on the podcast podcast. Um, this appears to be taking the place of that event. I know that event happens kind of every other year. So this is a great opportunity if you do have a bit of a gap in your diary around about the beginning of November and you're UK based and looking for an opportunity to come to London. But now that I have well and truly saturated you with gold in my own home, it's about time that I extend that out to all of you. And therefore, let's take a look at some of the incredible projects you have been working on in the last few weeks as part of the glorious Gold Along. As I've mentioned in the past, I like to try and split it so that we've got a few projects from Ravelry and then a few projects from Instagram. This week is an Instagram week for our gallery. And so without any further ado, let me showcase some of the just ridiculously awesome projects that have caught my eye over on Instagram in the last couple of weeks, all in support of our glorious Gold Along.
they're just ridiculously amazing, aren't they? Aren't they? I mean, seriously. Some of those sweaters are absolutely to die for. And I love in particular, I mean, obviously I love the ones that are entirely gold, clearly, but I love the ones that have chosen little gold accents, little hints of it. It just makes my heart sing. Thank you as ever so much to everyone that's taken the time to join our gold along. And obviously you've still got a bit of time if you do want to take part. And I look forward to wearing that gold in solidarity with you on the Saturday, the 19th of October. But that's pretty much it for this episode and indeed for the first year of Knitting Vicariously. I can't tell you how happy I am that so many of you are here, are enjoying it, are interacting both with me and others in the Knitting Vicariously community. It makes my heart so incredibly happy. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to come back for at least another year if you'll have me. So um, let's see how we go. <laughs> But yes, as ever, I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone for watching, for taking part in our Gold Along, uh, for dropping me notes, messages of support, whatever it may be. Um, I really do appreciate each and every last one of you. And it only really remains for me to wish you a wonderful rest of day, rest of week. I hope your knitting is keeping you happy and fulfilled. But if for whatever reason it isn't, I hope you have the opportunity to knit vicariously. Keep on keeping on, and I will see you again very soon. Bye. So you can see in here, it is pretty cavernous, to be honest. I'm doing a really piss poor job of trying to show you how, I mean, if you're looking to see how big it is, basically boob to head, that's how big we're talking here. <laughs> You know, in the universal scale of how big is my project bag? Boob to head ratio. That's roughly what we're talking. Sort of nipple to hairline, roughly. <laughs> That's how we measure shit, right? I was watching um, Amy of the Stranded podcast last episode. She's, she's in 150 episodes. That is batshit monumentally crazy. I am completely in awe of her in so many ways, but not least because of that number. But um, she was talking about, let's do a giveaway to celebrate that. And uh, her prompt was, tell me about your favorite stranded moment. And I just thought, oh, for the love of God, I never want to do that for this podcast because the times that I've met with people and they've just made a comment about something that I've said, usually at the end of the podcast, which is I suspect probably where this random ramble is gonna end up going. <laughs> and they've been like, I love the time that you talked about Oxbow Lakes. And genuinely, there will be a good few seconds of me going, the fuck did I talk about Oxbow Lakes for? <laughs> Clearly, I have not only no filter, but also very little recollection, which, in fairness, is probably a good combination. <laughs> but oh my, um, yeah, a year of complete and utter random nonsense, I think, is is quite the endeavour on on so many levels. 